ஓரஞ்சனம் நித்தியம் அனந்தரூபம் பக்தானுகம்பாதிரிதவிகிரகம் வை ஈஷாவதாரம் பரமேஷமிடியம் தம் ராம கிருஷ்ணம் சிரசானமாம ஜனனிம் சாரதாம் தேவிம் ராமகிருஷ்ணம் ஜகத்குரும் பாதபத்மேயோஸ்ரமீமுமுஹூர்முஹு நமஸ்ரீயதிராஜாய அவிவேகானந்தசூரை சச்சிதுசுகஸ்வரூபாய சுவாமினே தாபாரிணே So now we are going to continue with our study of Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga. So in the last class, we were in the second chapter. We were continuing with the second chapter that each is great in his own place. In this chapter, we found that Swamiji is saying that as per our state in life, as per our position in life, as per our responsibilities in life, our ideal need not be the fixed the same for all it varies as per our evolution as he told that if we try to adopt the ideal of the one who is already evolved it will be just like asking a small child to run a race of 20 kilometers either he will exhaust and die or he will be totally dehydrated so it's not the idea means we should choose the ideal in such a way that it instead of disintegrating us helps us to evolve so naturally it should be varied what's as per my gradation as per the level of my existence what's ideal today need not be the ideal tomorrow but i should not follow and try to imitate the ideal of someone who has already evolved that instead of helping me will be the cause of my degeneration and in the last class we were seeing for the last few classes that swami vivekananda referring to maha nirvana tantra uh, was enunciating the ideals of an householder a true householder if you just see the ideal of the householder you will find that it entails a lot of renunciation in no way his life is something which is uh, of lower rank the compared to that of a renunciate the renounce uh, the one who has is a recluse the one who has renounced his way of life may be different but ultimately the way of life entails in renunciation in self effacement and in another way the same ideal the self effacement is practiced by the householder but in a different way the ways may be different but the aim is the same self effacement that's the only uh, ideal of any spirituality the more we can forget our this petty self the more we evolve spiritually this limited sense of i is the only cause which is not allowing us to get established in my real nature i have don't in spirituality i won't have to attain something in sanskrit there are two wonderful words prapti and apti prapti means apraptasya prapti the thing which at present is not with me through my endeavor i have to gain it that is prapti like okay as from the childhood i have the aim that i want to become a doctor i want to become an engineer i want to become a very uh, mm, successful businessman whatever it may be that i am not at present through my endeavor i attain something in the future which at present i don't have i want to have wealth through my endeavor i get it so that is prapti 
What is apti? Apraptasya, prapti. The thing which is already with me. Just uh, in our scripture, they give the example that a, the lady of the house, she was busy with her work and suddenly she was in search of the necklace. She thought that it has lost. She was running hither and thither asking all, where is my necklace? I lost it. When someone pointed out, you see, it's around your neck. It was always there. It was just the forgetfulness that made her run hither and thither. So that's the idea. So here in spirituality, we won't have to attain anything. Somehow the wrong notion of this limited I came into existence. Get rid of it, you get again established in your real nature. So we will find in the householder's life, how nicely in the Maha Nirvana Tantra, we already have studied, we found that it started with the householder's responsibility towards one's own wife or in a mutually, uh, uh, what is a complimentary way, we can say the wife's responsibility towards the husband and the husband's responsibility towards the wife. With that, it started. Then it extended to the child. Then it extended to the other members of the family, to the friends, to other relatives. Very interesting. As if you, if you remember, we indicated that if you want to try and find the philosophy of any culture, Try to study the language. In the language, you will find the philosophy is hidden. So in Sanskrit, you know, we use the word stri for indicating wife. You know what has happened because of the past passage of passage of time, the usage has changed. What has happened actually stri doesn't mean the wife. Stri means the life partner for the wife Husband is the three. In the, if the real Sanskrit meaning, if you take, and for the husband, wife is the three. What's the word three actually mean? The one with whom I will do vistar. Vistar means I will spread. It's a wonderful idea. Generally, without the spiritual culture, for most of the commoners, the idea of marriage means total selfishness. That to enjoy the life, I need a life partner. I forget the world. I and my life partner, that's the world. So in Sanskrit, you will find wonderful the words three. The one with whose help I will be spreading, vistar. And that's the idea you will find. Even in the Mahanirvan Tantra, if you study the way, the sequence in which the responsibility has been described, it speaks of the vistar. I marry. With a wife, I have certain responsibility. It doesn't end there. It's not to encapsulate myself from the world and to just remain engrossed in some, there's, there's the, what you say, there's the, some uh, censored pleasures of the world. No, it entails a big responsibility that with the wife, I start my life. I have certain responsibility towards her. The wife also has the same responsibility towards the husband. It's a question of complementary relationship. Each complements the other. Then the children comes, the responsibility extends towards the children. It doesn't end there. You will find we have discussed. It now extends to the family, to the friends, to the neighbors, to the entire society. So you will find this word, such a wonderful word. That word itself is indicating it's not a life of just the sunset pleasure which enables you to encapsulate yourself from all the responsibilities and just say you and me, that's the whole world. No, the words three itself indicates and that's what in the Mahanirvan Tantra you will study, you will find in a, what a wonderful sequence they are extending gradually. So now let us again go back to the text to just see that what other tenets has been described in the Mahanirvana Tantra uh, to enunciate the responsibilities, the duties of a householder, which you will find at each and every step actually entails self-effacement. There is no place for just uh, taking things from the society and just growing like a cancerous cell. In the present world, with the, with the idea with the concept of consumerism, 
the entire society has become carcinogenic. You know what the cars in this cancer patient is like? A few cells in the body, they start growing disproportionately. They're supposed to grow along with the body with say with a proportion. What they do, they take the food from the blood. They take more food and they start outgrowing with beyond proportion. And the entire body is there to give it the, that signal. Don't do it. It is going to destroy, it doesn't listen. And it becomes like a tumor. And at last what happens? It becomes the cause of the death of the person and along with the cancer cells also dies. It's not going to leave if the person dies. It also dies. And that is what consumerism leads to. That the entire world is there for me just to use it as a just a sucking bottle, just a small baby is constantly suckling. We also need something to suckle and the world is there out, which I go on suckling and I have nothing to give to the world. If that's the idea, then we are bound to become carcinogenic. And there we find the scriptures are there by their do's and don'ts is trying to give us the precepts so that we need not have to learn through experience. In English, there's a very nice proverb. The wise learn through precepts. The fool learn through experience. In the human civilization, we have found again and again that we sometimes are acting like a fool. We forget about the precepts. We never recognize the wisdom which we have gathered, which were accrued through generations. Suddenly, I think I'm wise enough to decry the entire wisdom. They are just as if they are all nonsense. We just simply decry them and just think I have the right to just lead my life the way I wish. And for that, the experience is there to at last make us realize the wisdom. But by that time, unnecessarily we go through horrendous suffering. So that's why it's better to learn through the precepts than to go through the experiences. It's the wise who learns through the precepts. And the scriptures are there. Scriptures are not some, the uh, product of some fertile imagination of some human brain. It's a gradual evolutionary knowledge which came through our predecessors. And we will find at each and every stage of our life when because of our recklessness, we find that we have to face the negativities of life. And then we realize, oh yes, those words really have some meaning. Again and again, we find that's happening in our life. So the scriptures are there for us to respect them, that they are the product of the wonderful human evolution. And let us follow the precepts and that will help us to really evolve in life. We, otherwise what happens? As in the Bhagavad Gita, it has been spoken of that Rajasik Sukha and what's the Sattvic Sukha. Very nicely, that what's the Rajasik Sukha, which at the beginning appears to be something like nectar, but which ends up as poison. Agre uh, Agre ya Amritapamam Ante Vishamiva. And the Sattvic is just the opposite. At the beginning, it appears to be that all these restrictions appears to be like poison, as if toxic. But at last it leads in Amrita. It leads in eternal bliss. So that's the thing. In the modern psychological language, they just say that we shouldn't be myopic, short-sighted, to just not be able to see the future long-term gains and get infatuated by the short-term gains. We are so myopic, we see only the short-term gains, not the long-term. So the scriptures are there to show us the long-term gains. So now let us go back to the Karma Yoga, uh, the text to continue with all the uh, duties and responsibilities which has been spoken of uh, uh, for the householder so that they can lead a life which gradually through the process of self-effacement can take you, can take one to the same spiritual height that 
a renunciate, a recluse is aspiring for. So, so in the last class, just we were just speaking that the householder should not pay reverence to the wicked, that we, with the help of that Sri Ramakrishna's story, that Sri Ramakrishna's analogy, uh, that of the snake, which was asked by its guru, by the Brahmachari, that he was asked not to bite, but he wasn't uh, discouraged from hissing. So in this life, when we need that this, we see some evil and to save the family, which is your responsibility from all sorts of negativities, you may have to hiss, but at the same time, we should be aware, we shouldn't throw hatred. If you throw hatred, it is going to come back. Not that the person will uh, uh, repel, means will be revolting back and harm you. Even if he doesn't revolt, any form of hatred is going to harm us. How? The moment out of hatred, all the emotions like anger, jealousy, rancor develops in my mind, that is going to wreck me physically as well as mentally. That's one thing. And not only that, when I'm hating someone, I'm intensely thinking of that person constantly. Sometimes that intensity is so much, it is even more than the one whom I love. Constantly think of that person. And when I'm thinking of that person relating through hatred, it's only the negativities which I'm culturing in my mind. You will find that those who slander too much, they themselves develop those qualities because that's the thing which you're always culturing, always culturing the negativities through hatred. So the best way is be indifferent. Don't hate if you find that if anything is not something which is ideal, then just try to be indifferent towards it. Don't hate it, don't like it, be indifferent. That indifference is the thing just like when you are passing through the street and you, someone is just uh, crossing you. You don't know that person. You have no liking for him, no hatred for him. So that's the thing which means indifference. And that's the attitude it, we should have for all the negativities in life. Otherwise, we should know unknowingly through hatred, we will inculcate those characteristics which I am hating. So now, let us proceed to the text, the 17th uh, page. These three things he must not talk of. He must not talk in public of his own fame. He must not preach his own name or his own powers. He must not talk of his wealth or of anything that has been told to him privately. As you remember, uh, the same quality when the Maha Nirvana Tantra was enunciating of a person's attitude towards one's wife, the same thing was told, that he must not be bragging about his own uh, fame, or his own powers, his own wealth. That speaks of the narcissistic attitude, that one he's so possessed about himself that we told that such type of person, one should be very cautious at the very beginning. Know it for certain, that person is not going to care for others. He is extremely self-possessed. It is a narcissistic attitude. That person will never give importance to others' uh, well-being. He is always uh, uh, hungry to feed his own ego or her own ego. That narcissistic attitude. So that here also, the same thing. If you find a person that is always bragging about himself, know it to be the narcissistic attitude. It is an attention-seeking attitude. Not only that, it also encourages something that I actually don't want to give someone anything. It's just to grab the attention of others, I do that. And I do grab the attention of others. You will find a huge following in the form of friends you are having. And you may think, oh, such a, um, it's a huge uh, following in the form of friends I'm having, but know it for certain, at the moment of crisis, no one will be there. They are all there 
who are the flatterers and the opportunists who have gathered around you. Why? Because of your own mistake. You have tried to just make a propaganda of yourself, just to project yourself as something, a great man. And that has unnecessarily uh, have gathered the viral, the infectious element. You know, if you're healthy, the germs will try to come and produce disease in you. The same in the society, these viral elements are there who try to get the maximum advantage of your wealth, of your position, of your power. It may appear as they are your friends, as they love you, but actually they're more interested in your fame, in your power, and they want to grab something out of that. So you must be very cautious, unnecessarily don't brag. It's a narcissistic attitude and you will be inviting the negative elements in life. So always try to be reserved in those manner. If you have wealth, that if you want to spread out by helping the mankind, that in English, I mean, in our Indian language, they say, when the right hand gives, even the left hand shouldn't know. Do it very silently. It, after all, in giving, the happiness is mine. Know it for certain. You will find in life there is a tremendous joy in happiness. Uh, there is joy in giving. I will give you an example. When I was working for some time for in the welfare section in Belumat, I used to find a, a very interesting thing. Every day, uh, all the needy persons will be coming. And constantly they will be pestering for some money, 50 rupees, 100 rupees. And we will invariably ask, naturally we will ask, why do you want? And for days together, I was observing. One thing was very striking. I never found a person when he's asked that, why do you need the money? Will say that I don't have food to eat. I don't have clothes to wear. Never they say. What they will say? My child, I cannot feed my child. I cannot feed my wife. I cannot feed my family. I cannot give clothes to them. It's always to others they relate. It's very interesting. In life, when you can, with, if God has given you wealth and you can give others, sometimes you don't realize that how much pain, how much suffering is there when you cannot give. There's tremendous suffering. I found not a single person I found who ever came and complained that he's hungry or she's hungry. It is always that he or she cannot feed the young one. She is never bothered about her own hunger. It is a young one, it is a children or the other family members whom he or she cannot feed. That's the cause of their suffering. And that's why they need the money. So they, we should always remember there is a joy in giving. Tremendous joy in giving. That's how we can just go beyond our ego barriers and relate to our real, that our non-local self. It's something which is the plan of the universe. So do it because it is something which is quite natural. Why should I brag for it? I still remember when I, uh, in Belumat, uh, every day morning when we used to go and meet the President Maharaj, when I was a brahmachari in the training center at that time, Reverend Swami Bhuteshanandaji Maharaj was the president. And one day, and every day we were uh, just, uh, he was encouraged that any question you have, any grudge you have, when you're in an organization, of course, something you may not like, be open. So the president is like the father. He's as if a figure beyond the administration. So don't fear. Whatever you find, you just speak out. So one day one brahmachari, uh, as if grumbled, what's the grumbled? That we work so hard, we do really try to do something good for the organization. We try to reach out through our activities and we find no one praises us. But if we do a little mistake, as if the entire organization is there to come and scold us, censor us. So that was how he was grumbling. And Bhuteshanji, what he replied was something wonderful. But doing good is something natural for you. You are a brahmachari. You have left your hearth and home for self-effacement. That is natural. Why should others praise for you? Praise for that. But when you are doing something mistake, that is quite unnatural. For that, of course, you deserve scolding. 
So what a nice way of looking at the thing that why should we always be waiting for approbation for our good deeds? That's quite natural. You are bound to do that. You are supposed to do that. For that, why you need to be always having that uh, acceptance from the society? Do it silently. Yes, the mistake is something unnatural. I'm not supposed to do that. I being that spiritual being in the essence, I'm not, that is not befitting to me. That's what uh, Arjuna says, uh, Krishna says to Arjuna in the very beginning of the Gita, that na tad upapadhyate, na, 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 that this doesn't befit you. It doesn't befit you. That's the main idea that uh, with a negativity is something which is unnatural. For that, of course, we need that type of warning in the form of reprimandation. So that's how we, will, we have to have that type of attitude. That do, if you have to do good, do it silently. If you're always bragging, of your name, of your fame, of your wealth, of your power, know it for certain, it proves your narcissistic attitude and at the same time, you are inviting the negative elements in your life. And another thing which is mentioned, anything that has been told to him privately. In life, sometimes you will find that our problems, our misdoings, sometimes develops like a pressure valve. We need someone whom, on whom I have faith to relate. And that psychologically helps us. Just by relating, it helps us to, as if release the pressure valve. The person who is hearing, it is now his or her responsibility to not divulge it to others. It was something which was a therapeutic. The person never has the uh, intention to tell it to all. He just thought you to be someone whom he has faith and he divulged it just so that he can release the tension which is developing. And that's why we will find even the doctors in the Hippocratic youth, it is mentioned that the patients are bound to come to the doctor and speak out. The doctor shouldn't divulge it. It's one of the Hippocratic youth and it has some very deep significance meaning and we should be faithful towards others. The one who has faith in me, I should reciprocate the faith by not divulging the secrets which he is relating to me. See how you will find, how nicely it has gone to the details to explain that how that, that life should, we should lead an idea, uh, ideal householder's life. The, the, a person should not say that he is uh, wealthy at the same time if he's poor, that also he shouldn't say. A man must not say he is poor. Because you know, it is a, has a great significance. You will find the, its significance in the Sikh religion. The Sikhs, you will never find a single beggar. That whatever may be the condition of your life, don't extend of your hand. Be self-reliant. When you say you are poor, it immediately says subconsciously you are asking for help. So try to lead the life as per your means. Try to endeavor hard and try to become more and more self-reliant. Don't simply divulge, just say to others that I am poor. It is actually uh, proving that I want to be like a creeper depending on others. I don't want to be self-reliant. So that's the thing which is being indicated here. A man must not say he's poor or that he's wealthy. That, of course, the wealthy reason has been told in previously. He must not brag of his wealth. Let him keep his own counsel. This is his religious duty. It is not a choice. It is his duty. This he should do it. This is not mere worldly wisdom. If a man does not do so, he may be held to be immoral. Now here we think as if the scripture is too exacting. How can it be immoral? Okay, it's a good idea not to speak about your financial condition, whether I'm rich or poor. But if I speak out, yes, it is not very befitting, but how it can be immoral? Yes, it is immoral. It speaks something very interesting. 
you know, the, the more less we speak, that's better. In, even in the modern psychology, say, we say that sometimes we, what sometimes, most of the time, we are fooling ourselves. The left brain, the brain has the two hemispheres, the left brain and the right brain. The left brain is the language brain. The right brain, the right hemisphere is autobiographical. It registers what it sees exactly. The left is the language. <clears throat> Our biases sometimes cut off this left and the right. The what right perceives is not being communicated to the left. And then what the left does, very interesting thing it does. It will create a language which is just a mere propaganda. It doesn't reflect the reality. Uh, I will just speak of an interesting experiment. It speaks that how the immorality is involved here. A very interesting experiment is called split brain experiment. There are persons for whom the left and the right hemisphere had to be split because of some medical complications. And it was thought that such people don't have any side effect. But very recently it has been found out that those persons do behave abnormally in certain situations. So I will just speak of an experiment, a very famous experiment, that such a person who has a split brain, he was made to sit in a place in such a way that if anything is uh, displayed on the left side, or from the left, uh, so, then what happens, only the left eye can see. It is in such a way, the right eye cannot see it. He's been made to sit in such a way, the display is done in such a way, he cannot move his head, only the left eye can see that. And he's a person who has been surgically, he has a, made a split brain because of some uh, complications. A very interesting thing. Such a person when made to sit, and there was a display on the left side, walk. That person immediately got up and started walking. Now the one who was conducting the experiment immediately got wet. Why you got up the chair? Why are you walking? And this man, the way he responded was something baffling to all. He told, see, the, I'm feeling a bit thirsty. Uh, the, 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 you see the refrigerator there? I just want to go and have a glass of water. Now the one who were conducting the experiment they saw that it is because of the display walk he immediately got up. Then why he is making this story? Now, very interesting thing, that oh, there is a crisscross in our brain. Anything which you perceive from the left eye is registered in the right brain. What you see, perceive with the right eye is registered in the left brain. Now, as this person has a split brain, the thing which was displayed on the left was registered in the right brain, but it couldn't be conveyed to the left because of the split. For this person, it was a surgical split. Now, as it couldn't be conveyed, as per the instruction, he was made to stand up and walk. But the right brain, the left brain is the language brain, where no message was communicated. Now, it immediately found a baffling situation that why he's walking, he don't know. And immediately he makes up a story. Very interestingly, when the left brain is making up a story, even the person doesn't know it is making up a story. It thinks it's genuine. It's 100% correct. That's why I'm doing it. If you say you are fooling me, he will be just fully passionate about proving himself that he's correct. Even the person doesn't know. This, this propaganda is such. It will make a propaganda that what I am saying is correct. It's a propaganda machine. And it will be speaking out why why we are with our brain is made in such a way in modern psychology they say very interesting thing it is because of benefactance this word you won't get in dictionary but it's beneficial and effective that i am not a mad chap that i don't do anything without any reason if i do anything without any reason the society won't believe me so there is some reason behind whatever i do it is something beneficial for the society it is effective it is benefactance. So, to so prove that, the language brain immediately creates the propaganda. And you know, with these experiments, a wonderful book in psychology has come out. 
The name of the book is Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite. You will find in life sometimes you think what I'm saying is 100% correct, it's genuine. But the other person is doubting the genuineness. He said there's some hypocrisy. What's happening? You will find it everywhere. Uh, very interesting, a lot of research has been done. You know, there are some books where you will find the co-authors. Co-authors. And if you ask each of the authors individually, that's what's your contribution, both will say it is above 50%. Means it cannot be. Once, uh, if you ask one of the authors, that's what's your contribution, he will say it's like 70%. The other, if you ask say separately, what's your contribution, he also will say 70-80%. So what that shows, it's not that they're speaking lie, they genuinely think that they have the major contribution. Very interesting stat, interesting experiments has been done. When anyone has met an accident by car and is lying in the hospital bed, if you go and take the interview and you ask that person where you will keep your driving skills in a five point scale, they all keep their skills almost to the level of the test drivers of the car. You know that none of them will agree it was their fault. It's almost impossible. So these are the things we will find in life when there is a fight between the fans, some game is going on. Very, very, very serious fight happens. If you go and take interview, both will say the other side is in fault. In politics, the same thing happens. Everywhere you will find and it's not that when I am slandering others, praising myself, it's that I believe I have made up a story. The brain is such, even if it is not surgically separated, our biases separated both these two. It never allows the autobiographical right brain to relate to the left brain because of the biases, because of all our these emotional inclinations. It never allows. And we make up the story. We always make up. So we should be aware that where the immorality comes, the hypocrisy comes. It is something which is ingrained in us. Why? Because the nature always wants to sustain this psychophysical existence. For that it has nothing to uh, do with your real self. So when as a spiritual person, I should have the discriminating faculty, the way I see the world objectively, I should see this psychophysical existence also objectively. That's the first spiritual sign that I don't consider this as me and the other as something not me. And so I'm always objective towards other. And I think I have nothing to be ob objectifying my own body mind complex. This also has to be objectified the same way I objectify others. Be totally discerning and see its nature and don't get baffled by self love for it. It is like that a product of nature. It has its own if, uh, but deficiencies. I should be beware of it. The way I am beware of the negative elements outside me, I should be beware of the negative elements within me, which is ingrained in me because of the plan of the nature. And there comes the real uniqueness of the human uh, personality, the human psychology. It, it has that power. It can discern and it can stop from unnecessarily bragging or projecting and thereby trying to prove that benefactance, it's actually not required. So that the more we are silent, the more we give less importance to that left brain, the propaganda machine, the more we will find we are moral in life. So you'll find that psychologically, if you try to discern, it is actually morality. But when we are too much bragging or trying to project to the world my financial status. It's something which has to do with immorality. So the more we try to be silent and try to just think that what's the duty at this present condition? What should I do? How much endeavor is required so that I can be self-reliant? So that's what is more needed instead of just using the language brain, the left brain to divulge all those uh, things which are not to be divulged. The householder is the basis, the prop of the whole society. He is the principal earner. The poor, the weak, the children and the women who do not work 
all live upon the householder. As we mentioned, that, that you will see that in uh, uh, scriptures, it's mentioned that the four, these ashramas, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, Sanyasa. Now all the other three ashramas, the Brahmacharya, the Vanaprastha, the Sanyasa, this all are anchored to the householder. It's the householder who sustains the other three ashramas. The other three ashramas are not earning. It's a householder who is earning. So there lies a huge responsibility. All live upon the householder. So there must be certain duties that he has to perform and these duties must make him feel strong to perform them and not make him think that he's doing things beneath his ideal. Therefore, if he has done something weak or has made some mistake, he must not say it in public. Why we shouldn't say our mistakes in public? Sometimes we find that it is thought to be their genuineness. There are many books then they are sometimes the best sellers where you will find a so-called uh, person of reputation his auto has written his own autobiography where he's divulging all the weaknesses in his life. But here we find the scripture is saying is discouraging us from such thing. Why? Because you will find that in those books, the natural idea what's that however great you may be. As a human being in essence, we are evil. That's what comes out from all those books. That in essence, we are as if evil. That yes, uh, that we have done something good, but by nature, that evil is our real nature. The devil is sitting there. But it's just the opposite. Now, scriptures say that we are perfect, we are pure. There's nothing duality. There is no evil. Some say that yes, we are neither devil, we are nor God. We are a mixture of both. And most of us will uh, give, uh, will acknowledge to that fact. Yes, that's, that's what actually it is. But our scripture asserts, no, there is no duality. You are perfectly pure. You are perfectly uh, the, uh, the goodness personified then from where that evil comes. Very nicely they say that potentially we are all perfect. How the evil comes? Just take an example to understand that a seed has the potential to become a huge tree. But if it doesn't get the proper environment, if it is plant, it is sowed in a land which is clogged with water, so the seed will rot, it cannot grow. If it is too dry, the seed will again uh, cannot sprout because it doesn't get the proper nourishment. So the dry seed, the rotten seed is not the expression of evil. It is just the expression of the fact that the potential goodness didn't get the proper environment to sprout, to manifest. So you will find a wonderful way. The goodness is something within because of some cloud coming in our life of ignorance, cloud of ignorance, for the time being, we do some thing which the people, others think as mistake. But that is not the thing which identifies us. To say this, this thing, that suppose, is, to give an example, suppose a small child does a silly act which is not befitting. And the parent comes and scolds, oh, you are such a silly fellow. What happens? The child really starts thinking that he's silly. The same thing could have been told in a different way. Oh, you are such a nice chap. How could you do something silly? The same thing, you're saying in a different way. Now what happens? So oh, I'm a nice chap. Somehow I did this mistake, which is not my nature. So in English, they say a very interesting thing that if you treat a person what he or she is at this moment, he or she remains as he or she is. But if you treat that person as he or she should be, he or she becomes, transforms into what he or she should be. Because what I do doesn't define me. 
What I do today, can I, I can undo it tomorrow. I have that innate capacity to manifest the goodness within me. For some reason, I have done some mistake, but that doesn't define me. Why should I go on just speaking it to others? That in a way will make the people feel that evil is the thing, which is our innate nature. And not only that, unnecessarily they will put a tag on me, which actually doesn't define me. I have changed. I have evolved out of that. But people will just go and put that tag that he's such and such person, which is again not correct. And that will undermine my endeavor. Once you lose your accountability to the world, unnecessarily you, will creating a, you are creating a hurdle in your way of progress. It is a respect, mutual respect towards each other, which helps us to just uh, be a co-passenger in our process of evolution. And that is gone. The people lose the sense of respect. Even in the present society, you will find however great you may be, they will say, oh, basically we know that all are just evil. That we have almost lost the faith in the basic goodness because the way we always have the tendency to too much divulge on our weakness. We forget that it is we who do something which is very, very uh, crude, but it is again we who have the capacity to undo it and outgrow. We never give importance. The entire media you will find is never projects the good things in life. Anything, any negative, that's being projected. And as a result, what happens? Those negative things are just 0.01% of the events of the entire society. The entire society you will find believes in goodness. Most of the people are leading a good life. But when the media projects it, it's only those evil, that 0.01%. That becomes the be all and exist all from the first page to the last page. And you think this is the world. In a, what a wrong, distorted way the entire reality, the picture is produced when you are giving, divulging too much, when you are speaking out too much of the weaknesses, of the mistakes. So you should not. Therefore, it has been when it, if he has done something weak or he has made some mistake, he must not say so in public. And if he's engaged in some enterprise, and knows he's sure to fail in it. He must not speak of it. Such self-exposure is not only uncalled, uncalled for, but also unnerves the man and makes him unfit for the performance of his legitimate duties in life. The people will give you a tag and accordingly they will start relating with you and you will find unnecessary hindrances instead of cooperation you will find unnecessary hindrances is coming from the entire society which is bearing you in your progress. We should always remember environment plays a great role in our evolution. And it is I who am creating a negative environment by speaking out my weaknesses, by that self-exposure. So at the same time, he must struggle hard to acquire these things. Firstly, knowledge and secondly, wealth. All the learning should be for earning. So as a householder, it is not something bad. Because after all, that earning, again, will be for the society. It's not just for your selfish end. That, you, that as a householder, that's the only the nodal point of all the uh, sustenance. That as we were mentioning, all other ashrams depends on him. So that earning is something, a duty of the householder. It is his duty. And if he does not do his duty, he is nobody. A householder who does not struggle to get wealth is immoral. If he is lazy and content to lead an idle life, he is immoral because upon him depend hundreds. If he gets riches, hundreds of others will be thereby supported. So this speaks of proactive goodness. Goodness is not something passive. That if someone, that someone came to Ramakrishna and told, uh, must, uh, Mr. Master, such and such person is a very nice person. Then Ramakrishna asked, what does he do? No, he is a widower. His wife passed away quite uh, a few years back. So now he does nothing, but he leads a very nice moral life. 
Ramakrishna immediately, what he told was something very, very interesting. He told, oh, it seems he is elder the pumpkin cutter, which is very difficult to translate. In Bengali, he told, he kumro kata bot thakur. This what it means, very interesting. He says, he then he's himself explaining that word. He's saying that in a village, a man is there very, uh, as such, he does nothing immoral. But he's leading a relaxed life, more, uh, more appropriately lazy life. Always he just sits in the uh, courtyard of his house. And there is a, a charpoy is just a, a bait for relaxing. He will be lying there and constantly he will be just having some uh, smoke from his hubble bubble. He's very relaxed. But at the same time, he does no harm to anyone. He's a very good person. And what's his utility? Now, in the village folk, there is something very uh, interesting. Some superstitions are there. The woman folk in the village will never uh, cut a pumpkin into two pieces. First, that the whole pumpkin has to be cut to pieces by someone else. After that, yes, the, the remaining, uh, uh, this, what you say, the dressing of the vegetable, they will do. But it has to be bifurcated by someone else. Now this old, this person uh, that's always lying on that couch and having hubble bubble, he is called for by the woman folk from the inner apartment only for cutting that, whenever they have to cut the pumpkin into two, immediately they will remember him. They will call, oh, the elder, please, that uh, person, please come and please bifurcate this pumpkin into two pieces. So he comes, he does that and again goes back to his bed. So his utility is just in cutting the pumpkin to two pieces, no other utility. So when Ramakrishna heard that that person is doing nothing, just leading a good life, he told, this is like that elder the pumpkin cutter. What's the use of that type of goodness? The goodness should be proactive goodness. That you try to help out others and that in the process, it helps you to evolve spiritually. So that's why the householder, this if he is just not struggling for wealth, he's immoral. Though he may be not uh, doing anything as such as immoral acts. He's not stealing, he's not drinking, he's not um, in, involved in any sort of uh, these negativities, but just not by trying to acquire sufficient wealth, he may prove himself to be immoral because he's not doing his duty. If he is lazy and content to lead an idle life, he is immoral because upon him depend hundreds. If he gets riches, hundreds of others will be thereby supported. If there were not in this city hundreds who had striven to, who striving to become rich and who had acquired wealth, where would all this civilization and these arm houses and the great houses be? Going after wealth in such a case is not bad because that wealth is for distribution. The householder is the center of life and society. So if the wealth is for distribution, I earn and then I help or reach out to the society to help, then of course that is something which is as good as a spiritual as the spiritual practitioner who is a recluse, who has renounced the life. He is doing it in one way, but being in the household, being in the family, my way of self-effacement is different from that person. So I cannot imitate that person. For me to earn wealth and then use it for distribution is the same practice of self-effacement that a recluse is doing as a hermit in his uh, hermitage in, out of the society. The same thing. The two different ways and I have to choose the way as per my position state in life. The householder is the center of life and society. It is a worship for him to acquire and spend wealth nobly. For the householder who struggles to become rich by good means and for good purpose is doing practically the same thing for the attainment of salvation as the anchorite it's the recluse, the one who is a renunciate, the anchorite, does in his cell when he's praying. For in them, we see only the different aspects of the same virtue 
of self-surrender and self-sacrifice prompted by the filling of devotion of God and to all that is His. So that's the only clue for spiritual evolution. When someone asked Ramakrishna, how shall I be free? Ramakrishna's reply was wonderful. When I, that I within the inverted comma, when I cease to be, in Bengali, uh, it is just a pun of words. When someone asked, Ami Mukto Havo Kabe, Ramakrishna replied, Ami Jabe Jabe. So this to get read, to efface, get this of I, is the only goal of the recluse as well as the householder. The means are the different. So as a householder, just to acquire wealth by good means and then to spend it for the good purpose, to sustain others, where you are, you are effacing yourself. That's the thing which is as good a spiritual practice as the meditation of the recluse. That's why Sri Ramakrishna used to say that we have very vague about the idea of spirituality. He used to say, Amader dharmo, Amader adhattikata, Jalojog purjanta. Means our religion, our spirituality is still breakfast. That's what Ramakrishna used to say. It's very interesting. Why he used to say that? That you will find that in our household we have, most of us have that practice that in the morning we wake up, the first thing we do that we have just we go for the ablutions, have a nice shower, come and wear some clean clothes meant for worship. It is exclusively for worship, some clothes are there, we wear that. We have a corner in our house where there's a small altar, we go there, we offer our worship, meditate, offer flowers, most probably show some incense, and we really feel that we are doing something spiritual. It gives a wonderful feeling. And now I come back, I have spent some half an hour, and now I come back, change my clothes, wear the office dress, sit on the sit for the breakfast in the dining table that after breakfast I will leave for my work, immediately you will find you are a different person. That's the filling of that offering which you are uh, uh, in, um, having, the sense of self-offering, self-surrender, the time when we are worshipping, by just following a particular set of action. The moment that set of action is changed, I have some different actions now, immediately I find this is something secular, that was spiritual. So that's why Sri Ramakrishna is saying, Amader dharmo jalojo, till breakfast. But it can be made 24 by 7 affair, round the clock affair, if we just change our paradigm, our attitude, that whatever I am doing, in whatever situation in life I am placed, I just do it as an offering to the divine. Why? After God has placed me in this situation, in this life you will find uh, that at last wherever you are, almost you have no control over it. You have to agree that there is some higher divine plan for which you are there with certain set of responsibilities. It is not yours. God has given you to evolve through them. Why not do it with a sense of offering? Okay, God, you have kept me in this place. I am entitled to take care of these responsibilities. As you have placed me and you have entitled me to do this, I do it as an offering to you. Whatever work, I do it as an offering to you. At the end of the day, I offer it to you. Just the way you are offering fruits, water in the altar. This work, which appears to be a secular work, I offer it to you and this is my worship. It can become, and then the spirituality can become a 24 by 7 affair. That's what is mentioned. It is a worship for him to acquire and spend wealth nobly for the householder who struggles to become rich and by good means and for good purposes in doing practically the same thing for the attainment of salvation as the anchorite does in his cell when he's praying. So I will just end up the class with another Ramakrishna's words. He used to say, Kolite. In this Kali Yuga, our prana, our vitality is totally dependent on anna, on food. Sometimes people translate it as if we are of we are weaklings compared to the 
previous generations. We cannot uh, stay without food too long. We constantly have to take too much care to feed ourselves. Uh, we cannot endure. Uh, we cannot just endure too much of hardships. Actually, that's not the meaning. You will find a wonderful thing: the paradox of the civilization. What's the paradox? The entire civilization has evolved. You know why? Just to find out a bit more leisure. We were food gatherers. We used to go to the forest to just gather food, the roots, the herbs, the fruits, come back. So our existence was day to day. Whatever I get, I feed. Next day I have nothing. Again, I go out. Now, as for the civilization, what happened? We invented, we discovered agriculture. And now with the advent of agriculture, what happens? I can produce food. I was from food gatherer, I become food producer. And now I can store. For six months I work, for six months I have leisure. I have stored. And it is the leisure which has given the, all our culture. And then in that leisure time, what I do? Yes, I cannot spend just uh, without any engagement. Yes, there is someone in the society who has been kept free to develop the uh, what is the skills of music skills of drama and now they are there to entertain me they do not have to go for agriculture so i again developed that so these lasers have created a civilization very interesting in constant search of laser at last what has happened in our household we can never think of it even 100 years back to save our time there is the washing machine there is a they are a dishwasher everything is there to save your time so that you can have more laser but the paradox is, we find that from morning till night, I have no leisure. In search of our leisure, at last, what has happened? There is no leisure. Whether you earn $1,000 or you are $10,000, $20,000, immaterial of the fact, from morning to evening, just to sustain you, just to earn your money, you have to. The present civilization is such, you have to be in the work. So where is the time for worship? So now you will find unless I have, can have the capacity to convert my work into worship, it is almost constantly will be repenting. So that's why Ramakrishna is saying that in Kali Yuga, we have Annagata Prana just to earn our livelihood throughout the day, like a slave we have to spend, however you may earn, whether you are earning just meager or you're having thousands of dollars, you have to give your entire life for that. Where is the laser for your spirituality? The luxury of that spirituality is not there. So unless we can really convert our attitude and find that work itself and just can convert that work itself as an offering to the divine, it is almost impossible to practice spirituality. And that's why Sri Ramakrishna is saying in this yuga again, the worship has become very simple. It is a sharanagati. It is just to take the name when and whenever is possible, little and just to have Sharanagati, that itself can speak of a wonderful spiritual evolution. So as per the society, present society will find these instructions are more appropriate, that unless we can convert the work into worship, we can never find separate time for the worship. And that's what the scripture is instructing us. So with this, we stop our discussion today. We'll continue uh, with uh, the Mahanirvana Tudra again in the next class. Namaskar. Thank you, Swamiji. Namaskar. 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 Namaskar.